So I said we would uh, start talking about fractions today. Uh, sorry, give me a second to close some stuff. Um, having said that, uh, mathematicians will will never use one word if they could use two. So instead of instead of talking about fractions, again, we just need to give Zoom a moment to uh, get used to the fact that I'm writing. Anyway, instead of talking about fractions, We'll be referring to not to rational numbers, um, which has always seemed like a kind of funny thing to call them. I mean, rational and irrational sounds like a value judgment, but just um, so that we're all on the same page, a rational number looks like this. It's one number divided by another number, or more to the point. It's one integer divided by another integer. Um, I think my spelling would be better, but sorry about that. Um, so like five divided by seven or two divided by three. Yeah. Um, there's no reason that the top number should be smaller than the bottom number, except that, you know, as you first teach your students this material, that's the way it's going to be. And that's because if the top number is smaller than the bottom number, there are very easy ways to visualize this. You can think of M over N, as meaning that you have something broken up into n parts. And of those n parts, you have m of them. So, you know, if you think of two divided by six. You can think of a, a pi or a bar or whatever divided into six pieces. And you have two of those pieces. So there's two sixths of the bar. And I mean, as you're presenting this material to kids, I know that I say this isn't a pedagogy course. I, I talk just a little about pedagogy. I mean, this is, you know, it's very easy to say, well, here are candy bars. We have a candy bar. We have one candy bar. But look, it's chocolate. We break it into pieces. And now we have a fraction of a candy bar. And as this material is being presented for the first time, you'll also sort of want to emphasize, you know, one half, how much is one half? of a pizza, well, it depends, right? You can get a small pizza or a medium or a large pizza. 
So to understand a fraction, at least initially, you would say that the rational number, the fraction, really has three pieces. You are seeing two of them. You are, let, let me try to keep using M and N in the same way. You are seeing two of them. You're seeing the number at top and you're seeing the number below. But there's this third invisible piece. What has been broken into and he says, and this is invisible, but it's important. It's why having half of a candy bar and half of a pizza are two different things, even though the number is the same. So, The first common core standard that we're going to address as we move through this material is that whole numbers. So up till now, the students will have only worked with whole numbers, five and four and two. Maybe they'll have worked with negative numbers. I'm not certain which comes first, but they'll have worked with whole numbers. You know, one, five, etc. And we'll want our students to understand that whole numbers are also rational numbers. This is sort of how our number system is built up, right? We start with the positive counting numbers together with the zero. Zero, one, two, three, four. Then we start doing subtraction and we realize, okay, we need more numbers. If we're going to do one minus seven, we need to have negative numbers. So we start with the whole numbers. And then we define the integers. And the integers are bigger than the whole numbers because five is a whole number, but five's also an integer. And then we start doing division. And when we start doing division, we haven't learned about fractions yet. So we talk about remainder. You know, something goes into something so many times, and there's such and such an amount left over. But at some point, that stops being satisfactory. And we say, okay, well, if we're really going to talk about division, we need rational numbers. We need fractions, but the whole numbers and the integers are also rational numbers. They're in this group, and they're in this group, why? How is five a fraction? You can put it over one. You can put it over one, exactly correct. Any number, can be thought of 
as that number divided by one. As part of the same common core requirement, students ought to recognize that some but not all rational numbers are whole numbers. And of course, we've just seen an example of that, five over one. Five over one is a rational number. It's also a whole number. Four over two. It's a rational number, but it's also a whole number. Four divided by two equals two. And your students, again, this is part of the common core, should be able to recognize when this happens. And it happens if doing the division gives you a remainder of zero. It's actually, in my opinion, a little, a little complicated and a little abstract. The idea that four over two is a number, but it's also how we write division. Because a number is a number and Division isn't a number. Division is a process. So I actually think our, um, we're sort of using the same notation for two different things. And I think that might sometimes cause confusion. But if you think of four over two as division, we can do it. And we either get the remainder or we don't get a remainder. And we don't get a remainder as it happens, which means that 4 over 2 is a whole number. So when students are learning about numbers, when kids are, we use the number line. I mean, that's the the classic, it remains the classic. And when they're first learning about numbers, even though we call it a number line, we haven't taught them about fractions yet. So most of the line is not being used. When we first introduce the number line, it's really just a bunch of points, zero and one and two and three and four, and all of the rest of this line doesn't mean anything. And then at some point, we say, oh, well, this line could go in the other direction as well. And we introduce negative one, and negative two, and negative three, and negative four, and so on. So this section where we introduce rational numbers is the section where the line really starts to look like a line, where instead of having just a bunch of scattered points, we have, well, I'm repeating myself, but we have an actual line. So the next 
common core standard that we are going to address. is to represent rational numbers. E. I apologize for the whiteboard. I don't know why it sometimes does this, but our goal is to represent rational numbers on the number line. And at least at first, we're going to keep assuming that the top is smaller than the bottom, because again, that's how fractions get introduced. And if the top is smaller than the bottom, then this fraction will be somewhere between zero and one. And it's pretty straightforward. Well, that's that's bad pedagogy, saying something straightforward. It causes your students not to ask questions if they have any. It's something I'm trying to break myself of. But you break the interval into pieces. And the denominator of the fraction, the bottom of the fraction, tells you how many pieces. Then count up to the eighth. And I've always found, I suspect you are also going to find, that introducing material in this way, I mean, it's the way the textbooks do it, where you've got these abstract letters, and it probably makes things much harder to understand than if we have actual numbers. So let's dive right into an example. Let's try to find three eighths on a number line. So three is smaller than one. So three eighths will be between zero and one. And we're going to take this number line and we are going to slice it, this interval, into eight pieces, trying to make them as even as possible. I know, I, I cheated. Eight so nice. You just have to keep cutting things in half, but trying to keep them as even as possible. And then you count up. Here's one over eight, two over eight, three over eight on the number line. Questions so far? So this is where we get, um, let's see, I won't say tricky, but this is where we get to the point where like in college algebra, I see students making mistakes. And 
The concept is reducing fractions. But before we talk about reducing fractions, We ought to make an observation, and this is an observation that you make very early on with your students, that two fractions can look different. But represent the same number. And when we say that, I mean, it's, it's one of these things where, yeah, obviously that's true. But, I mean, as, as to the children, this is very different from what's come before. I mean, whole numbers do not have this property. If you're working with whole numbers, five is five. There's no other way to represent it. Three is three. And now we have rational numbers. And suddenly we have a bunch of ways of writing the same thing. One half equals two fourths, for example. And we can represent, we can demonstrate this easily enough. I, um, I mean, blocks would be the sort of standard way of doing this. I, we, I struggle teaching with blocks. I stand here with them in my hand and I think, can anyone actually see what I'm doing? But I mean, here is a candy bar. Here is the same candy bar. Here's the candy bar cut into two pieces. Here's the candy bar cut into four pieces. So I am, I am building directly on what we just did, I am looking at these numbers on the number line, and we can see that one half and one two fourths take us to the same place on the number. From this observation, we're going to make a statement. I guess the formal, the, the very sort of fancy way of saying this is that it's a theorem. Um, and the textbook sort of messes around with terminology and calls it a fundamental law of fractions. This is, I say it's playing around with terminology. It's because normally the word fundamental gets followed by a by theorem. There's a fundamental theorem of algebra, there's a fundamental theorem of calculus, but there's a fundamental law of fractions.
And I don't know if it seems that fundamental when you first see it. The fundamental law of fractions says that if you multiply the top and the bottom by the same amount, it doesn't change the fraction. Let's try to ask ourselves visually why this happens. Um, like let's say, according to the fundamental law of fractions, One half and sorry, not one sixth, but three sixths are the same. So here is one half. And what you're doing when you multiply the bottom by three is that you're taking each of those intervals and you're cutting them <clears throat> into three pieces. So we had one interval here that's now turned into three intervals. We have one interval here, which now turns into three intervals. And because, you know, we now have more intervals, we've cut this up finer. This number here is no longer at the end of the first interval. It's at the end of the third interval. So this is one half. Now it's three sixths. We see that the number hasn't changed. The dot remains precisely where it is. One half and three sixths are indeed the same quantity. And what makes this fundamental? I mean, the book doesn't justify its terminology. What I think makes this fundamental is that it lets us reduce fractions. It lets us decide if two fractions are the same. So, I mean, that is pretty fundamental. I mean, if we didn't have a way of knowing that one half and three sixths are the same fraction, that would be a problem for us. So let's talk about these concepts. They're related, but different. We'll start by talking about reducing fractions. So why is why is five tenths equal to one half? I mean, it's something that you probably know is true, but how would you prove it? What's the actual argument here? How can we use the fundamental law of fractions to show that five tenths is the same as one half? Division. Division. So the fundamental law of fractions is framed in terms of multiplication. But multiplication and division are basically the same thing. What you'd probably say is that, well, you can, multiply, you can divide the top and the bottom by five. And if you divide the top and bottom by five, you get 
one half. Framed in terms of the fundamental law of fractions, we're multiplying by a fraction. Dividing by five is the same as multiplying by one-fifth. And we get one divided by two. And it's really useful um, to remember that this is what we're doing. I mean, whether you think of it in terms of division or whether you think of it in terms of multiplication, either is okay. But the reason that college algebra students cancel in ways that they're not allowed to cancel is that they lose track of what's actually happening here. They just sort of think, well, when you reduce a fraction, you're, you're writing, you're cutting stuff out of the top and you're cutting stuff out of the bottom. So if we have one plus X divided by X, we can cancel those and get one. And of course, that's not true. I mean, this is an error that they're making. And if you remember what's happening here, it's not an error you really can make. You say, I mean, we could divide the bottom by x, and we could divide the top by x, if we do that, you know, the denominator will cancel, but now we've got one plus x times one divided by x. That's not the same as just casting the x's out. So if you can really internalize what you're actually doing when you simplify fractions, and I guess more to the point, if you can help your students really internalize what they're doing when they simplify fractions, you're going to save yourself and you're going to save your students a lot of grief down the road. So another application, well, let me quick look at the whole thing. Um, well, let me do another example or two of reducing fractions. Um, reducing fractions, I'm going to say it can be kind of a pain if you're trying to do it by hand. And that's because I mean, how did I do with this reduction? Well, fundamentally, we had to recognize that the top's divisible by five and the bottom's divisible by five. And you know, if I have 101 divided by 219. You, you don't have to write this down because I'm going to tell you straight out if you ask me to reduce this or if you ask me if this can be reduced, I just sort of stare at it and not know how to start. I mean, the top and bottom aren't divisible by two, they're not divisible by five, they're not divisible by 10, they're not divisible by three. I don't remember the rules to check if they're divisible by seven or 11 or other numbers. So it really can just be a chore of trial and error. And I'm afraid you're going to, to discover this in the homework, but I do try 
to be nice to you. It looks like the problems I gave you um, to simplify using five or ten or three or two, because those are the tests that I think are the easy ones. Um, how does, do people remember? Does anybody remember? How do you check if a number is divisible by three? You can add the digits, and if they're divisible by three. That's exactly correct. Thank you. So, 51 over 63. This can be reduced. The top and bottom are both divisible by three. And the way I know that, five plus one equals six. Six is divisible by three. Six plus three equals nine. Nine is divisible by three. So having said that, I, I know a whiz at doing a mental division. That's three into 51, it goes in once. Three into 21, seven times. 17 over 21. And this won't reduce further because 17 is prime. But again, that's the kind of thing that, that you sort of have to build up some experience in order to, to just look at it and say. Let's keep on with the fundamental law of fractions. Uh, well, does anybody have questions, first of all? And let's keep on with the fundamental law of fractions. And let's ask a question. Now, this is a question with a few different answers. I the textbook has far too much material to cover in 16 weeks, so I'm going to just give you the answers that seem the nicest to me, because I can't tell you everything in the textbook. The question is, how do we know If two fractions are equal, and let me add a second question to that. How do we know? If one fraction is bigger than another. That second question is not, um, obvious by any means. I mean, is one half bigger or less than 498 over 987? It's, I don't know, it's difficult. And at least one way to approach both these fractions, both these questions, I should say, is that it's easy to compare and talk about fractions if they have the same denominator, if the bottom of two fractions are the same. So A 
over C versus B over C. These fractions are equal. Is IFF terminology that people have run into before? No. Is it only if? It is exactly that. If and only. If. So A over C equals B over C, if and only if A equals B. So, you know, five over seven versus four over seven. These are not the same. And, you know, this example makes it sound, seem a little silly, because, of course, they're not the same. But something like, you know, 4 over 7 versus 498 over um, 860. I don't know, just sort of picking an example at random. Those could be the same. I mean, it's possible to write the same fraction in different ways. 1 over 2 and 5 over 10 and 15 over 30, those are all the same fraction. What would make it very straightforward to tell whether these were the same fraction or not is if we could write them so that they have the same denominator. And you've probably heard terms like least common denominator. And I'm here to tell you that the trouble involved in finding least common denominators is almost always more than it's worth. Never mind the least part. Let's just find a common denominator. And we can, if we have two fractions and we want them to have the same denominator, there's a way we can always make that happen. And again, it's based on this fundamental law of fractions. We can take this first fraction and we can multiply the bottom by 860, and we can multiply the top by 860, and that isn't changing the fraction. The fundamental law of fractions says that it isn't. And now we can take the second fraction and the fundamental law of fractions says, so if we multiply the top and the bottom by seven, we're not changing the fraction. But you see what we're going to get. We're going to get the same denominator. It's going to be seven times 860 in both cases. And at this point, I mean, it might be, you don't need like a fancy 
graphing calculator for this class, but having something to do with multiplication quickly with might be convenient. 7 times 860 is 6,020. And now let's see if the clocks are the same. Four times eight sixty. Three four four zero. No. What? I must six twenty. Six thousand twenty. Yes, but three four four zero. The denomination. Uh huh. So it's seven times eight sixty. Sixty twenty. Thank you. Then uh, four ninety eight times seven. No, don't want to share anything. Three four eight six. So these fractions are pretty close. To being the same, but they're not actually the same. And which of these fractions is bigger? The right one. Um, when you have the same denominator, Comparing sizes is straightforward because you're just comparing the numerators. You know, one over seven is less than two over seven, is less than three over seven, is less than four over seven. 3,440 is less than 3,486. So the left fraction is less than the right fraction. And again, that only works because we went through the trouble of finding a common denominator. One half is greater than three tenths, even though one is less than three. So we'll pick up with this. I'm not sure. We might want to do a little more with simplifying. Um, you might struggle a little with problem two still. That's okay. But for the most part, you should be able to do the homework for me. And really, I didn't bring enough. So, they are me for like one minute. You, here. Are you dirty? Yeah. Thank you so much. And honestly, you need to send me a picture of it. I appreciate you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
All right, let me just log off this time and not steal your uh, Google's password.